caring for a child having a seizure is all about the basics. Make sure the child can breathe, keep her safe, and observe her carefully. Seizures may be related to trauma, decreased cerebral perfusion, infection, fever, electrolyte imbalance, poisoning, or tumors. Most seizures in children are idiopathic, meaning that the cause is unknown, although there might be a genetic or familial trait involved. Epilepsy is the term sometimes used for a chronic seizure disorder. There are two broad classifications of seizures based on patterns of activity, partial seizures and generalized seizures. Partial seizures. With partial or focal seizures, children may describe a hollow feeling, a sensation of falling, or feeling afraid. Partial seizures are described as simple or complex. With simple seizures, there is no loss of consciousness or awareness, but there are alterations in motor function, like one-sided fist clenching or isolated jerking of a body part. Sensory symptoms, like hearing sounds that aren't there, paresthesias and feelings of anxiety, autonomic signs such as flushing or pallor, and sweating or an aura, which is sometimes the only sign of a simple partial seizure. Then there are complex or psychomotor seizures. These seizures are often preceded by an aura. Generalized seizures affect the entire brain and are categorized as absence or pettit mal, myoclonic, atonic, akinetic, or tonic clonic. They are not preceded by an aura. With absence or pettit mal, the child might lose consciousness for about 5 to 10 seconds many times per day and have minimal or no loss of muscle tone. For example, the child might drop something she was holding in her hand. She might also be accused of daydreaming or labeled with ADHD. Often the first sign parents notice is deterioration in schoolwork and behavior problems. The usual onset in children is between the ages of 4 and 12 years. This seizure pattern often disappears at puberty. A myoclonic seizure is characterized by brief, sudden contractions of a muscle or group of muscles, such as the arms and legs, neck, or shoulders. Movements may or may not be symmetric. They may be benign or associated with other seizure forms or disease of the nervous system, such as viral encephalopathy or degenerative diseases of the cerebrum. With atonic seizures, sometimes called drop attacks, there is a sudden loss of muscle tone resulting in head nodding or falls to the ground, usually face down, which can cause facial injury and a brief loss of consciousness. An akinetic seizure is characterized by lack of movement without loss of muscle tone. The child appears frozen but does not fall and has only a very brief loss of consciousness. Tonic-clonic or grand mal seizures are preceded by an aura and followed by postictal lethargy, confusion, unresponsiveness, and amnesia. The tonic phase is characterized by stiffening of muscles and extremities with the loss of consciousness and is followed by the clonic phase with rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the extremities. These seizures may be accompanied by the loss of bowel and bladder control, a clenched jaw, an apnea with cyanosis or hyperventilation, a piercing cry, and drooling. Status epilepticus is a continuous seizure or repeated seizures in rapid succession for longer than 30 minutes. This is a medical emergency requiring prompt treatment and airway management. Remember, prolonged seizure activity depletes the brain of oxygen and glucose, leading to permanent brain damage. When evaluating a child who has had seizures, You'd get a detailed history from a reliable informant, including not only the current information, but also covering the prenatal, perinatal, and neonatal periods. From the history, it might be possible to identify the cause of the seizures, such as fever, which would be an isolated event unlikely to recur, or a symptom of serious disease, such as a brain tumor. And the history and description of the seizures must be equally detailed, including precipitating factors, time of day, the age of the child at the time of the first seizure, duration and progression, any aura and postictal behavior. You'd also use your observation skills. To determine the type and cause of seizure, consider the following points as you interact with the family. Conditions that can mimic seizures include migraine, headache, syncope, drug toxicity, transient ischemic attacks, breath holding episodes in infants and young children, and brainstem herniation. Cocaine intoxication can also mimic seizures, and the principal metabolite of cocaine will be found in the child's urine. There are a number of diagnostic tests that might be done. CBC to check for lead poisoning or infection, electrolytes, toxicity screens, glucose level, 
lumbar puncture, brain imaging, studies like a CT scan or MRI, x-rays, and an EEG with the child awake, asleep, and while hyperventilating, and long-term video EEG recording. Treatment begins with a single anticonvulsant medication, monitoring drug levels, and then adding additional medications as needed. If the cause of the seizure is a hematoma, tumor, or cerebral lesion, surgery is the treatment of choice. For epilepsy, surgery is reserved for children whose seizures are not well controlled with drug therapy and who have had no periods of remission from the disease. Because the risks of death or permanent severe brain damage are very high with this type of surgery, intensive counseling with child and parents should be done before the decision is made to proceed. There's also vagus nerve stimulation achieved with an implantable device in children 12 years old or older who have partial seizures either with or without secondary generalized seizures that are not well controlled with drug therapy. The child can activate the device as needed to deliver a precise pattern of stimulation to the vagus nerve. For status epilepticus, initial treatment is airway maintenance, oxygen, and hydration, followed by IV administration of phenobarbital, diazepam, lorazepam, or phosphenatoin. Clients who do not respond to drug therapy may require general anesthetic agents for seizure control. As you care for a child who has seizures, you'll react as quickly as possible to make sure the child can breathe, protect the child from injury, and make pertinent observations about the seizure episode. Your observations may provide valuable information about the diagnosis and management of the disorder. You cannot stop a seizure once it has begun and you should make no attempt to do so. Instead, place the child in a side-lying position to protect the airway and prevent aspiration. Loosen any restrictive clothing. Do not restrain the child or place anything in her mouth. Provide supplemental oxygen and obtain assistance as needed. Observe everything you possibly can about the pattern and characteristics of the seizure episode. And after the seizure, check vital signs, especially respirations, and let the child rest. Meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges lining the brain and spinal cord, classified as bacterial, viral, or tuberculous. The majority of cases are either bacterial or viral. With bacterial meningitis, the causative organisms are primarily Haemophilus influenza type B, Streptococcus pneumoniae, or Pneumococcus and Neisseria meningitis. Meningococcal meningitis usually occurs in epidemics and because it is the only type easily transmitted by nasopharyngeal secretions, it is seen primarily in school-aged children and adolescents. Also note that H. influenza is most preventable in the autumn and early winter, while pneumococcal and meningococcal meningitis is more common in the late winter and early spring. Clinical signs and symptoms vary with the age of the child. Neonates are difficult to diagnose due to vague and nonspecific symptoms that resemble all types of neonatal sepsis including refusal of feedings and poor suck, vomiting and diarrhea, hypotonia and weak crying, hypo or hyperthermia, jaundice, irritability and drowsiness, seizures, altered respiratory patterns or apnea, cyanosis, and weight loss. A tense, bulging fontanelle is a late sign, but unlike meningitis in older children, the neonate's neck remains supple. Signs and symptoms in infants and young children include a bulging, tense fontanelle, this is hallmark of meningitis in the SAGE group. Hyperthermia, anorexia, vomiting, marked irritability and restlessness, seizures, nuchal rigidity or stiff neck, high-pitched crying, and positive Koenig's and Brudinsky signs. In children and adolescents, the onset of symptoms is usually rapid, but may be delayed and preceded and also masked by respiratory and GI symptoms. Look for fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, headache, and possible seizures, extreme irritability and aggressive behavior, altered level of consciousness, nuchal rigidity, and opisthotonus, which is an extreme overextension of the head, positive Koenig's and Brudinsky sign, petechiae or purpura with meningococcal infection, drainage from the ears with pneumococcal infection, and joint involvement with H. influenza and meningococcal infection. A lumbar puncture is the definitive diagnostic test for the causative organism. Also found are elevated white blood cells and protein, decreased glucose, and elevated cerebral spinal fluid pressure. Blood, nose, and throat cultures may be also done.
Antibiotics such as cephalosporins are often prescribed to decrease the incident of antibiotic related hearing impairments. Other medications used in the treatment of bacterial meningitis include dexamethasone to manage increased ICP and to reduce the risk of bilateral deafness from H. influenza disease, antipyretics, anticonvulsants, analgesics, and sedatives. Your nursing care considerations begin with the frequent assessment of neurological status, including level of consciousness, vital signs, pupillary response, and symmetry of movement. You'll also monitor for specific signs of increased ICP. For infants, measure head circumference and palpate fontanelles. Decrease environmental stimuli and provide uninterrupted rest periods. Take seizure precautions, elevate the head of bed 30 degrees, maintain respiratory isolation for 24 to 48 hours after antibiotic therapy has begun, always wash your hands, place the child in a sideline position if nuchal rigidity is present, keep the child NPO, then increase the diet as tolerated, and document intake and output accurately. As for family support, allow parents to verbalize their concerns and feelings. Teach them about the disease process and treatment. Encourage the parents' participation in their child's care. Recommend routine vaccination for H. influenza type B, which should be started when children are two months old. And if it's necessary, teach parents about home IV antibiotic therapy. What are some of the complications of bacterial meningitis? Obstructive hydrocephalus, epilepsy, hearing and vision loss, neurological damage such as cerebral palsy, learning disorders, and ADHD, and SIADH, that syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion. Non-bacterial or aseptic meningitis is usually viral in origin, with either an abrupt or gradual onset. It is often associated with mumps, measles, herpes, and leukemia. Initial signs and symptoms include fever, headache, malaise, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Signs of meningeal irritation appear one to two days later with irritability, altered level of consciousness, nuchal rigidity, and photophobia. A maculopapular rash may be present. Symptoms usually subside spontaneously within three to ten days with no residual effects. Diagnostic lumbar puncture shows no bacteria, slightly elevated white blood cells, normal or slightly elevated protein, and normal glucose. Treatment is primarily symptomatic. When taking the history of a child who has symptoms of meningitis, consider whether the child and family have traveled to, been living in, or are immigrants from a developing country where tuberculosis is common. What are the characteristics of tuberculous meningitis? Drug-resistant TB may put an increasing number of children at risk for tuberculous meningitis. The most common signs and symptoms are meningeal signs, fever, altered level of consciousness, and seizures. Hydrocephalus is a common complication if the diagnosis is not made early enough and treatment begun. Treatment is organism-specific and your nursing care is the same as for children who have bacterial meningitis.